So, uh, last lesson we looked over the previous chapter one and we looked, we're looked looking forward at chapter two. Uh, this should be recording by the way, guys. You can hear this on Discord. Yeah, excellent, okay. Um, I'm gonna close Chrome because I don't need Chrome open. Okay, um, so what we're gonna look at this chapter, this, uh, this one here, okay, so I really hate reading stuff straight off the book, but so I'm going to try and uh, give you a very brief um, overview of in terms of engineers as problem solvers. So when I think about, so I'm using the example of like my professional experience. I think the an example I can think of where I really was an engineer as a problem solver. Um, I, I did a lot of stuff that was where as an engineer as a problem solver where I, I wrote software. So that was probably my skill set as I, I was a competent software engineer for a civil engineer. And so that kind of made me valuable in my, my work. Um, but generally speaking, I think as a civil engineer, the, the times where I really did problem solving, um, uh, I'm just thinking in hindsight, I probably should have had it so that I only had my window, but you know what, I don't care. Um, I wonder if I can turn off notifications. Uh, no, don't care. That's the sticking with the I don't care but for the strategy. Okay, so the main top place where I can think of where as a civil engineer where I did um, a software problem solving is, so I, I did a substation design and I remember like that was a, a tough situation where I had to figure out where, I mean, there were a couple of things now I think about, but the substation was the biggest project where we had to put down um, a set of transformers that needed a concrete pad and just trying to fit that in the right location. And that me meeting with the electrical guy, meeting with the, the, track, um, the track asset manager, the person who, who was in charge of that area of the corridor and talking about, okay, how, what are the problems, what are the constraints on this design and how are we going to, how are we going to meet the needs of our, project, of, of our design? But I guess really on a daily basis, I used to get a phone call from uh, the site engineer, this guy called Paul, and every, every morning the phone would ring and I would know it would be Paul. And um, I would say to Paul, okay, so, well, it just happened to be the guy's name. And it's like, he'd tell me what the problem was today. And um, then it was my job in that day was to draw up. So he would talk to me about what he thought was an acceptable solution. And I would say, okay, well, yes, but there are these things that we need to consider. I would check the design and say, look, I looked at your solution, but that's not going to work. So let's do this instead. And he'd say, yeah, it sounds fine. And then I would draw up, I, I would hand, hand draw the, the drawings, send them to drafters. Drafters would certify those drawings. So they could start building from my hand drawings. And then once that once I'd signed a hand drawing, they would then, uh, drafters would do a formal drawing and then that would be signed by the head of the project to become officially part of the drawing. Okay. Um, you are killing me with the notifications because like all of this is being recorded and it's just, it's a, it's one additional thing that, uh, you know, if it's not really adding, if it's a legitimate question. Okay. In here. Notifications. There we go. I'm going to go with at settings so that that'll. Now I can still hear you talking. Okay, so this is going to be great. When I use these videos for for next year's students and the years afterwards, they're going to enjoy this. Uh, you know the benefits of um, the Corona shutdown. Okay, so engineers as designers. So I teach design technology, and. I do actually think that for broadly speaking, it is actually the most useful subject that we, we teach at high school, that uh, very few people really need to know how to find you know, the, uh, the gradient of a curve or um, like the gradient of a parabola or do integration and calculus, those sorts of things. They, they don't really apply to many people's day-to-day -day life. And engineering, well, that only applies to people who want to be engineers. It's great for people who want to be engineers, but if you don't want to be an engineer, it's not a very versatile subject. Whereas design, I think, really does apply to pretty much every job that is a, a an actual career. I mean, 
I used to have a boss who said that you know it, it, she would always use the sh as a shorthand if you want to have a job of putting the cherries on the top of cakes that doesn't require a whole lot of thought but generally pretty much every other job has some degree of design so as a teacher I, I use design strategies all the time to evaluate what I'm doing to think about what are the outcomes of what I'm trying to achieve um, but you know the processes that I use to um, to make my decisions. And I think the design is really important. Engineers is design. So I, I talked about, well, so what's the difference between a problem solver and a designer? That's where I find it it's interesting. This is an interesting syllabus stop point. But I guess if I'm talking, if I'm talking about engineers as designers, what I would suggest is that um, engineers as designers is probably more uh, considering things like, if for me, I would say that it's using the Australian standards. So if I type in like, so the Australian standard for bridges, this is the Australian standard I used, was the AS5100. And the AS5100 contains within it things like the AS3600, which is the concrete code, right? And then you guys, the one that we drum into your heads all the time is the AS1100 is the uh, drawing standards code. But there's other ones like uh, 1684, I think it is, is the timber framing code. Let's have a look. Uh, yeah, residential uh, residential timber framing code, which for builders is really, really useful. Like that, that's an excellent code. Uh, I think it's the easiest one to read by far. Uh, like it's designed to be used by builders. And um, that if you're replacing a wall, that's gonna be the thing that tells you what is the appropriate timber size to, to put in there using tables rather than complicated formulas. Um, okay, but so typically engineers as designers, we do, there is the design process of understanding the problem, researching, uh, f developing solutions, evaluating those system solutions, coming up with a final design, managing that, man so design often considers management, which we'll talk about in a second, and then evaluating the success of those those plans. So, I mean, evaluation was a big part of my job. So it, after we did any stage of our project, so I, I mentioned before about project proposals, the red review, the gold review, the final review. After we submitted the, the final review, we would do a uh, lessons learned. And certainly after we wrapped up a project, often after even, so in rail, um, a lot of the work is done in stages called possessions, where you take over the, you shut down two or three of the tracks and you only have like limited traffic through the through the area. And this is where people are on the buses. And I'm, I'm sure that if any of you ever had to take the bus um, instead of the train, it's a frustrating time for the public. And the idea is that you have to have, so you have to return the track to the uh, the, the rail authority. So in this case, it's now called Sydney Trains um, by like 5 a.m. And if you're one minute over, that's a huge fine. So you have to be ready to hand over the track so that it can be returned to public use by a certain timeline. And usually a possession is, to, is 48 hours. And so the 48 hours of possession is planned to the minute and um, it's, it's, there's a lot of work that goes involved, a huge number of people come on a site, a lot of work is done, and then we hand the, the track back over. After every possession, there's usually a lessons learned um, where people discuss what, um, where, where people discuss you know, what, what we could have done better, what we did well, where are the concerns, what are the things that the people who are gonna do the next possession should be aware of. Okay, so engineers as communicators. So I talked about that example of the substation. And I, I remember, I mean, the reason why that probably sticks out in my mind is when I was going for my chartership. So after you've been working for about four years as a as an engineer, the um, a lot of designers get a, they, they attempt to qualify for a, um, a chartership. So you get the letters, the post nominals, let, letters that go after your name. That is, uh, instead of just putting your degree, your Bachelor of Engineering, you put instead, uh, we can add to that CPENG. So capital C, capital P, capital E, and lowercase ng for Chartered Professional Engineer. So um, I got my, my Chartered Engineer and as soon as, uh, I also got a bonus from my office. And as soon as I got that bonus, that's when I resigned to say I was going to go into teaching. And I guess for me, getting that chartership was kind of a... Um, a milestone that I was looking for. But when I was uh, applying for that, so I had to go for an interview with two uh, senior engineers and I had to demonstrate that I had sufficient knowledge. The substation was the, the, the one that sort of provided the most, um, 
the most challenges. It was also sort of a design that I led. So that was sort of the example where that I used for a lot of things. Anyway, so when I was working on that project, communication was really important, an important part. Freehand sketches were how I communicated with the other stakeholders to say what we needed to do. Now, typically for me, I remember once I was at dinner with some friends and I was saying, like, our, our, my work wouldn't let me do CAD. And basically the idea was that um, engineers were too expensive to spend wasting time on CAD. So engineers were supposed to hand draw things and then hand them over to, um, to drafters. And then drafters would redraw what we had drawn. Now, I don't know if that was an effective use of our time or not, but I mean, I guess as a company-wide policy, we felt as though that, was safe, that saved us time. Um, but yeah, communication with the drafters was really important. We had systems in place to make sure that our communication was effective. So whenever we would draw things, we would highlight any changes we wanted in yellow. Then they would, when they had made those changes, they would mark it in green. And then when we were happy with those changes, we'd cross them out with red. So that sort of system of, um, of, of proofing things was important. Okay, so engineers as project managers. Now, I would say project management is actually part of design, but uh, the vast majority of, of um, engineers actually work in project management. So designers make up a fairly small section of the community, uh, of the engineering community. So if your attitude is, oh, look, I'm going I'm to design bridges, know that far far more likely that you're going to be someone who supervises the construction of bridges. Or like, so if I look at my friends now, um, until recently, I would have said I had two friends who I went to uni with who were working as designers, like proper legitimate designers. Uh, now I would only say there's one. So my friend Lizette still is a, um, she's a facades engineer. Uh, my friend Aaron, he used to be a water engineer, but he's now in operations management. So he now works for the council, um, which I argue is you might as well be a teacher if, if you're going to work for the council. But um, for him, you know, he, he probably wouldn't be a great, t well, I don't know. I don't want to make those uh, those comments, at least not publicly. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm sure he would be fine. Okay, so now we're going to look at historical developments of the lawnmower. So we talked about in 1830, we had these push mowers and this guy, Budding, well, so John Ferraby developed a, a, a push mower. And then we have... Um, the budding, which was manufactured by Ferraby. There we go. Um, so circular cutting gear drive. There was a front mounted catcher, which uh, was where the, the grass clippings would go. Um, these days, a lot of the time, if you do have a push mower, you don't have the catcher. You just leave the, the grass on the, on the, the clippings on the, the grass and you know, it just photo, it fertilizes below that. Okay. So Followers and Bay, so that's 70 years later, was the, it's still a push mower, but it's starting to use steel in the, in the, in it's still, uh, steel components. The Royal in 36 was the first petrol driven motor. Okay, so it uses steel, uses a chain drive. The Victor in the, the, in the 50s was a two stroke mower. We're gonna talk about two stroke um, in a second. Um, okay, and it was, okay. So then we have, okay, the 60s two-stroke motor. So unfortunately, the scan doesn't give us great resolution here, uh, but we have some advantages. Can't see the screen? Okay. Cheers, okay. Um, well, Hopefully I've still record, I've recorded the, the video. I mean, I haven't said anything that's important at this point. Okay, let me just quickly show you the pictures. So Ferraby's 1830. So I've, I've talked about the board game last time. Uh, the 1900s, which is just a uh, developed um, better materials using steel. Uh, so we have the Royal 19th, 1936, so 100 years later, we have petrol driven, uh, two stroke chain driven uh, engine. We have the Victor uh, 50s um, two-stroke engine. Then we have Advances in the in the 60s. So it's self-propelled. Um, impulse starter, muffler. Okay, and the polyethylene catcher. So polyethylene is a polymer and it's using a polymer to catch it. The reason for that is because it's non-corrosive and lightweight. Okay, so the Sunbeam in 74 was a 
160cc. So we've talked about a cc being a milliliter and it's a measure of um, the volume of all of the pistons. Okay, um, it, it, yeah, it just cuts down on pollution. And then this is a 2011 Honda four-stroke engine using a PET fabric uh, instead of a rigid polymer. Okay, um, you can have a difference between mulching and catching. It's far more versatile. Okay, so in terms of the car development, so that, that's about, I don't really want to go into too much detail for the lawnmowers. You'll do um, a lawnmower history at some point for your um, engineering report, but we're going to go on to the development of cars. So, okay, before we get on to the Model T, there were cars that were developed before that. So there was the Benz Patton motor wagon and um, the development of the first car by Gottlieb Daimler. Um, so there's elements like when we talk about the brakes, we'll talk about, so Bertha Benz and how she was instrumental in, in developing brake pads uh, using orig originally using leather. But for, the, for now, we'll just start with the Model T because the Model T was the first mass-produced um, mass produced automobile. Uh, so there were vehicles were available, but pretty much they were unrecognizable. I have a picture on the back of my wall um, of the, Patton, the Benz Patton motor wagon, and it really doesn't look like a car. It looks more like a horse-drawn carriage, a light horse-drawn carriage, for that, that matter, without the horse. Whereas the Model T, it really does look like a car. So it was fairly in, in, um, innovative and um, influential just in that, that point. Okay, so Ford, um, there's a lot of negative things said about Ford, about his personal life. But in terms of business, he was generally considered to be a pretty good businessman. So he developed, or if he didn't, um, if he wasn't the originator of, he was certainly the first person to really see wide um, wide and effective adoption of the um, manufacturing line. The idea is that one person would do one job all day and by doing that they were very effective and they'd pass the object or the car would roll down to the next section and the next person would do the next thing. Rather than one person doing the whole process, one person could be very good at doing things. Now I think the idea is that in modern production lines you do rotate people around through the various stages so everyone you know, upskills. But um, doing one thing over and over again means that you're less likely to make mistakes. You're more likely to remember your systems uh, more effectively. Okay, so uh, the joke was that he could say you get it in any color you want as long as it's black. And um, so they were only available in black. And he chose black because it had the quickest to dry paint. Um, it had it was four-cylinder, 2.9 liter, um, liter engine, which was one-piece block. Okay, two-speed gearbox for, um, plus reverse, and it operated by pedal change. Okay, top speed, 64Ks. So it's a big innovation on, and this is really, I mean, 64Ks is a real car, whereas the um, the Patton Wagon, I think, only went m much slower. I don't know, I think 20Ks, I believe. Um, but I, don't quote me on that. That's, uh, that's a little bit off the, you know, from memory. Okay, so... In terms of the, the cost, I think that they were less than a third. I mean, I'm basing this mostly on um, on the on like role playing games like Call of Cthulhu, where you, you buy items in 19, 1920s dollars, and um, and I'm pretty sure that the the Model T thought for it was was substantially cheaper. If someone reminds me, I will. Uh, if someone asks me how much they cost. I will find that reference and let you know how much they, but they were substantially cheaper than any other cars at the time. Um, and the big thing was that Ford supposedly paid very good wages. So that's worth mentioning as well. Um, okay, so it was a very effective business and the UK's equivalent to this was the Austin 7. So the Austin 7 was, so it's a much smaller engine. I mean, if you look at that, it's 2.9 liters. So this is 600 mils. Um, it was then upgraded, three-speed gearbox, four-wheel brakes. Um, it was low, with a low price for four seats and it could go faster. Okay, so the Austin 7 was the UK equivalent of, um, of the Model T. The German equivalent, which was developed by um, Porsche, so... It, Porsche uh, has, uh, is famous for its own line of German car, car manufacturers. Uh, so Hitler during, um, I 
guess it was before the war, but um, anyway, while he was Chancellor of Germany, he commissioned um, Porsche to design a vehicle that would be the people's car, which was Volkswagen is, is German for people's car. And the Beetle was the development. So they actually had a common, there was a variety. There's also like the Combi and um, a couple of others I can't think of at the moment. Okay, so... What's interesting about the Beetle is the engine was at the, the rear of the car. Um, so I think that that way it had direct direct rear wheel drive. I think that was its advantage. But it was supposed to be also very easy to maintain. Um, these days, the Beetle is no longer in production. But if you go to Mexico, well, it's generally South America. But um, I know that when we went to Mexico, I mean, I, I did see them in Argentina as well. I think Argentina may have the most. But when we went to Mexico, like punch buggy, um, you know, that, that punch buggy game where you hit someone when you see a, a VW or a, a, or a Beetle, uh, that takes a whole new meaning when you go to Mexico. It's like you're getting punched a lot because there are... Okay. Um, so the Volkswagens, yeah, very reliable for their time. Now, you wouldn't say they were reliable now, but by the time that they were very reliable and easy to maintain. So that was part of their success. I think that for a while, they were the most sold car ever. Um, they, they have been overtaken. I know that these days it's the Corolla is the most sold car ever. Um, okay, so the Citroen uh, DS19, I have a picture of this on my wall as well at the back. And the thing that it's famous for is it's um, hydro pneumatic suspension and it's pressurized braking system. Okay, so these uh, looked really weird. Um, and, you know, like you can look at, let me see if I get a picture of it. DS19. So it's an odd looking car, but in terms of ride comfort, it was unprecedented. If you were in any of these other cars, you would definitely feel like, if you drive in, in old cars, it's, it's actually you know, a mildly uncomfortable thing. It's not like riding a horse is uncomfortable, but it's um, you definitely feel the shakes of, of every bump on the road. Whereas the DS19, from what I'm told, I've never driven one, is probably the first car where you would really feel as though modern levels of comfort um, in terms of ride quality. And so ride quality is a pretty a pretty realistic thing. Okay, the Mini, I think, was also for a time the most sold car because I think it was it went into production longer than the Beetle did. So that's why it was, the I think, at one point the most sold car. Um, but, you know, again, I, I don't think it says it here. So it just it was a very popular car. If you have ever seen um, the Italian job, there's a scene in the Italian job where they're driving these minis all around, um, up and down stairs. And so I won't play the video because I've learned my lesson from yesterday that if I play the video, so that this is them driving through like a shopping center and, you know, because... Um, so they get the, they do they make their getaway in the mini. Uh, so the mini was interesting in terms of I mean I, I, you can read these details here about the the motor was rotated 90 degrees and it had a relatively long wheelbase for the size of the car so the wheels were out as far as possible. So it had excellent handling for a car of its size. And um, so it went on to surprisingly win a lot of uh, motor races. I couldn't, I don't know, follow motor races enough to give you a more interesting uh, account of that. But so that's the idea of the Italian job is that because they were so small and so they had such excellent, excellent handling, it didn't matter that they were necessarily, they weren't the fastest of cars. It was the fact that, you know, it was very hard for the police to catch these cars because they, I think in the Italian job, they're still gold. I've only seen the remake, which they use the modern mini, but you know, not quite the same. Um, I was going to say, does it have Sam? It doesn't have Sam Rockwell. It has Edward Norton, who looks a lot like Sam Rockwell in it. He's the bad guy. Anyway, um, but because they're so small and they have excellent handling, it just they were able to drive through buildings. They were able to go downstairs. All of these sorts of things. Okay, so um, the four-wheel drive that they mentioned is the Range Rover, which is um, it was in production from nineteen seventy to ninety six. And it first, uh, first wide, widely used uh, four-wheel drive. So obviously that has implications for countries like Australia, where we have a lot of unpaved road, where people are trying to get access to um, 
you know, places only accessible through dirt track or or whatever. Um, okay, so if we keep going on, we have engineering the effect of people's lives. Well, okay, so lawnmowers, the effect of people's lives. Um, I'm just clean my glasses one second. Okay, before we had lawnmowers, what we had to use was a scythe. So there's a board game called Scythe, but I won't show you that. Um, there you go. See, internet already is a new computer. They know that I like board games. Um, so a scythe is the thing that the Grim Reaper holds. Yep. Um, not to be confused with a sickle, which is a smaller hand hand version, which is what they used um, in the flag, the Soviet flag. Um, but the idea is before that, if you wanted to cut grass, what you used is a hand tool like a scythe or a sickle. Um, now, t definitely there's a lot of efficiency in using the um, 1930s Firabi uh, rotary cutter compared to using a sickle. Absolute advantage there. Um, but nevertheless, it was still something that is quite heavy relative to what we would use in a modern, modern lower mower. These days you can get rotary mowers, but they're using much lighter uh, lighter materials than the Ferraby uh, um, mower would use. Like just in the fact that you can use steel and steel is so much thinner and lighter, like so for the same strength, the same cutting power as what you would have with um, Ferraby using iron. Okay, so uh, this mower here was better um, for negotiating obstacles. The gear drive now includes... Uh, okay, so the gear drives, by having gears, it gives you a mechanical advantage. So we watched the video on spinning levers. Let me see if I can get that for you. Uh, Scandium. I really need to put an ad block on this. I haven't put an ad block on my new laptop yet. Okay, um, spinning levers should be on here. There we go. Spinning levers, I don't know if we've watched this yet. Um, I'll let you guys watch this, but I think this is legitimately worthwhile watching. Um, so what it talks about is just at a very, you know, it's old, but the thing is, if I'm showing you a video that's old, it means because I think it's still worthwhile. So it talks about the mechanical advantage of levers, but then goes on to talk and the, the yeah, we we'll just stick with the term of mechanical advantage of levers, and then goes on to build upon that to talk then about um, uh, to talk about actually how gears work in cars. So how we are able to change gears, how the gearing, um, to how we can get a reverse gear. So I think those things are quite interesting to watch. They're not stuff that we really go into in detail in the course. There's no syllabus stop point for this, but I think this video is is um, is legitimately worthwhile and um, you know just for your own pers personal uh, interest. Okay, so the Royal was what we can start st starting to look more like what we we now identify with a modern um, lawn mower. It has a petrol engine, drive driven, uh, chain driven. Okay, then we go to Victor's, so the 50s, the 60s. I'll let you read those in innovations. But the main thing we're looking at is different materials, and those materials typically mean that we're less likely to get corrosion, where it's less weight that we have to, to push. So all of these, um, just progressively as we go down, we're getting to less weight. So it's easier to be used by, especially for people, you know, typically mowing is a job done by men, and when you have a nuclear family, that makes a lot of sense. But uh, as you're starting to get different demographics in, in society, there often might not be someone who can lift comfortably lift a um, heavy lawnmower, and so that something that can now be used by all body frames is you know or, or put people of a, a range of ages and um, genders and body shapes is is important. Okay. In terms of cars, so. Uh, there's a video that I'll show you later um, in year 12 where they talk about innovation of um, innovation aviation but it's a high school teacher who's, who's talking about I mean I could find the guy it just yeah why not so this is calcium go through planes where's the planes so we here off this one show 
Okay, so this guy here, I'm pretty sure in the video where he's talking about the evolution of planes, he also talks about, um, right at the start, he talks about, oh, I've got to find the plane one. If I'm going to get this much effort, I might as well see it out. Oof. It's definitely this guy, a different video, I can't see the video. I don't really want to go to greater effort than that to find it. Um, okay, so it's definitely that, that this guy, he has a video on the history of planes. He talks about how the Wright brothers, they invented, uh, so they didn't invent, they, they invented the plane, right? So the Wright brothers invented the plane. Uh, well, I think that's a fair claim. Um, maybe not perfectly accurate, but close enough. But what they did before that for their day job is they sold bicycles. And the reason they sold bicycles is because by the time that they were selling their bicycles, cities were already banning horses. And the reason they were banning horses is because horses leave bio waste, right? Poop all over the street. And there are cities in, um, in America where cars are banned. And um, when, I, when you read it on the internet about people's experience of visiting these places, um, that they just stink off poo because that's how you, you, you know, the, the garbage truck is not a garbage truck, but it's a garbage horse. And um, this was a real concern that people saw with, with horses um, that as populations grew, that it just was no longer sustainable to continue to have a growing number of horses in cities. Okay, so bicycles, a, a lot of towns required you, according to that guy, Graham Wise. Uh, a lot of people required you to... Um, to leave your horse at the outskirt of town and then you would ride bicycle or, or walk into town from there. Okay, so early cars were slow, noisy and expensive. Um, at some point I, I could find, if people remind me, I'll look up, so there's Adam's Ruin Ruins Everything. You may have... Um, Why jaywalking is a crime. He talks about the in social influence of cars and the idea that once upon a time the car, the, the road was no longer the road was not specifically reserved for cars. These days the road is kind of considered reserved for cars and that it was the idea that it became illegal to walk on the car, car was for the benefit of car drivers. Now, he says this like someone who probably doesn't own a car and that's fair. I, I know a guy who, who doesn't have a license. He's in his 30s and doesn't drive. And, you know, there are people out there like that. When I lived in France, I didn't have a car um, either time because the public transport is very good and the city is... Um, it would be very difficult to drive a car in sort of populated areas like New York or Paris. But for most people, I think most people are quite happy with the fact that the car, the road is reserved for cars. Now, I mean, I think that video, the Adam Ruins Everything video, makes a good, good argument and it tells an interesting story. But it's, it is important that in terms of the general utility for society, it is far better that we have the, the, the status quo of... Um, cars being reserved for the road being reserved for cars if anything um and this is a name i've had a lot with my brother who is he rode a bike to adelaide um he's a big believer that the road should either be for bikes or for cars but not for both the fact that um, if it wasn't for the fact that bikes happen to exist before uh cars there's no way that they we would allow bikes to be on the road now because it's just way too dangerous okay so Okay, the Model T came along and the Austin 7 had a similar effect in the UK. The development of the four-wheel brakes um, made car travel much safer. So again, another resource that I'll add on to this is I talk about 99% Invisible a fair bit. There's one called The Idiot Behind the Wheel. The Nut Behind the Wheel. Uh, and so generally, the this it's interesting. So for Australians, I mean, this won't be too much of a um, a mind bend, but we are mostly in Australia would generally have the attitude that gun ownership is something that should be restricted and limited. Whereas I have friends who live in America who they go to someone's house and they're like, do you want to check out my guns? That's a very unusual thing to have in Australia for someone to say, do you want to check out my guns? Um, unless they're talking about their biceps, and in which case it's you know, different context. But um, 
funnily enough, with this uh, virus lockdown, my brother has been telling me that they've had to suspend gun purchases in Victoria because of like, you know, um, the, anyway. Uh, okay, so development, uh, okay, so this nut behind the wheel talks about how once upon a time, it was generally considered that, you know, cars don't kill people in accidents, bad drivers kill people in accidents. And it's interesting how over time that, that has changed, that we've now put the responsibility on car manufacturers to provide us with safe cars. So once upon a time, this, the time, the leading cause of death in a car accident was being impaled by the steering wheel. And yeah, so these days they've replaced that with collapsible steering wheels so that that way you're far less likely to be killed by the steering wheel. And then with public pressure has led to things like airbags, seat belts, all these sorts of things. Now, it's interesting to note that the car companies were very hesitant to introduce laws for seat belts. This was something that, you know, unless you're like say Volvo, who was leading the charge on, we're the safe car company, but most people are like, no, I don't need a seatbelt. I, I, you know, I'm. Uh, this is America. You know, I have my freedoms. You can't force me to wear a seatbelt. The same way that my brother's getting upset that he's not allowed to go to the beach. Um. So anyway, through the twenties, we start seeing uh, better braking. Okay, cheap cars after World War Two. So for a lot of the time, when I say, what is the? When did this this technology develop? Well, the answers are usually. The technology that developed by the Romans, or the te technology was developed during the Industrial Revolution, or it came about as a result of World War One, and then you know, saw widespread use in World War Two. That's generally a pretty pretty good rule of thumb. So when we're talking about things like cars, cars did exist before World War Two, but it's interesting to hear, especially in Australia, in terms of home, home uh, car ownership in Australia there was basically no very very few cars especially in suburbs of, of sydney um so rich people could afford cars but we're talking about owning a car was kind of like the same as owning i don't know a bentley you know so i've seen bentleys you know i've seen dozens of bentleys hundreds of bentleys but the idea is people would talk about the times they'd seen cars but the idea that someone would own a car, that the regular person, you know, the middle class person could afford a car prior to World War One in Australia, World War Two in Australia, was pretty rare. Um, in America, not so much. I mean, generally it would be business people would own cars. So either you were rich enough, like you were a businessman, like Jay Z is not a business, he's a not a businessman, he's a business comma man, or it was because you were a tradesperson or the guy who delivered milk. Uh, you needed a car for your job. So um, in Australia, it was really even less so. So even um, in Australia, my understanding is in the 30s that the Milko was still just as likely to be uh, traveling on, on a horse. Uh, the, the Milko being the guy who delivered your milk was just as likely to be traveling on a horse as he was to be traveling on a car prior to World War II. The difference is World War II, unlike World War One, World War II is really a, um, a war where troops were mobilized by cars. Yeah, so in World War I, uh, people had cars, generals had cars. Maybe the doctor who was being delivered to or from the front line would be sent by in a army car. So there would be an army driver who would pick up the doctor, take them, take them to the location on the front lines. Uh, not in the trenches, mind you, but you know, the front lines. Um, where, whereas World War II, everyone was being mobilized by cars. This is why like the German, uh, the German form of warfare was called Blitzkrieg, lightning war, because it was so fast. Uh, the, the speed that they were deploying troops was just unbelievable for, their, for, the, for the allies until they started adopting vehicles themselves. So the idea was that a squad of 10 or 12 men would be sent on the back of a, 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 a truck and uh, resources were being sent back to trucks. So it got to the point where most veterans would leave World War II having learnt to drive, and then they thought saw that this was a hugely advantageous thing. So also the other element that comes into play is that a lot of the companies we associate as being car manufacturers, companies, I mentioned Bentley earlier, but Jaguar, um, Mitsubishi, BMW, and Mercedes, all of those companies, they developed engines for fighter planes. Right, so we'll talk. We'll do aviation uh, this time next year. But BMW, um, it's not entirely true. I've heard that the BMW is symbol. The symbol is supposed to be a white propeller on a blue sky. I mean, that's kind of apocryphal because anyone who's been to the Bavarian beer cafe in um, 
in uh, Miranda will tell you that blue and white has been the, the Bavarian colours for as long as uh, Bavaria's had colours. But certainly the Mitsubishi logo is a propeller. The, um, the Mercedes logo is a propeller. Bentley has wings on its logo because, uh, and Bentley still makes uh, the best engine parts. Oh, Rolls-Royce as well makes engine parts. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So all of those things have led to. Um, so when when World War Two ended, suddenly you didn't need a whole bunch of fighter planes anymore. But so those companies retooled, and instead of producing fighter planes, they then started producing uh, uh, personal vehicles. Okay, so fifty nine saw the the arrival of the mini. So suddenly people started to see that there was um, you didn't want necessarily a big car. Big cars were a status symbol. This is what people were used to from the war. But the mini said, "Hey, look. Sometimes it's you know, more cost effective. It was more affordable. It was easier to park in congested London." Okay, improving in handling, improving improvement in sa um, safety. So I mentioned earlier that Volvo. Um, pretty much so there's ads about bloody volvo drivers right um so this ad bloody volvo driver is um said about how the woman's driving the volvo you know and come on what about how many ends up having this video not be allowed to be put on? Anyway, so someone runs through the red light, right? But because she's driving a Volvo, the Volvo's got such excellent stopping, she doesn't get caught in the accident. And because she's got the safe car, she, she, her and her family aren't involved in an accident. But then the guy who runs through the red light yells out, bloody Volvo driver. And the idea is that Volvos, I don't know if the Volvos have this reputation. I think if I asked my kids, they wouldn't recognize that Volvos are famous for being the safe car. And so one of these elements is that um, Volvos, were the, they developed the seatbelts and rather than restricting that patent so that they, they licensed that patent to every other car manufacturer because they thought probably that it was in their best interest in that anyone who was going to buy a car on the basis of safety was already going to buy a Volvo anyway and that they'd probably get better PR out of being the company that gave the world the seatbelts. Um, rather than actually just holding onto the seatbelt themselves. Anyway, so Australia was one of the first places to regulate, uh, to require people to wear seatbelts, first in Victoria, and then by 72, everyone had to have seatbelts. Um, okay. So in the 70s, despite the Mini, big cars were still a status symbol, but then there was a um, fuel crisis in the 70s. Uh, basically, th through conflicts with Middle East, um, not armed conflict, but through diplomatic conflict with the Middle East, the price of fuel went up and suddenly, um, let's see if I can find a, a good picture of this fuel crisis. So, uh, they all There we go. So like you have pictures where it's like, sorry, no gas, ask Nixon for some, right? So the idea was it was Nixon's fault that there was no gas. Um, and so this situation of people who were unable to buy petrol, they actually reduced the speed limit because cars are more efficient at about 80 k's an hour or, or less in those days. And um, this was really like a huge influence in the, the shape, the design of modern cars. Fuel efficiency became much more of a thing. People started worrying about the economy of their cars, like the, the fuel economy. These days, fuel economy is, and this is where Volvo did get, and Volkswagen, I'm sorry, got, did get in trouble. Um, the Volkswagen emission scandal, which we'll talk about in a second. So that's where the efficiency is, um, in, is the biggest issue now. Okay, so yeah, people were interested in reliability, efficiency, emissions, and safety. Um, pollution concerns, so yeah, so they talk about the effect of taking lead out of petrol. And lead paint. So the phasing out of, of lead from, from petrol, so they say that um, the effect, so in motor fuel, like that the number of violent, um, violent 
deaths, murders, all that sort of stuff has been di like directly linked to the removal of lead. At, like, so you can see trends of where a state banned lead pe lead petrol, it had an effect on um, in that state of violent crime reduced proportionally as as um, as lead was removed because lead lead poisoning apparently makes you crazy and violently crazy. So that's why they've also banned lead out of paint. And um, so that's why I had to go to titanium oxide for our, our paint. There's a, um, a good 99% invisible about titanium oxide. It's called uh, Darkest Materials, but I'll leave you to find that one. Okay, so um, emissions scheme. Okay, so uh, more recently, we could be possibly getting to the point of actually reaching the, the barrier of what we can achieve with um, reducing emissions in petrol engines. We can only make them so much more efficient than they are currently. Um, I don't know how to remove that. I'm just hoping that will go away. Okay, so um, that what Volvo, what Volkswagen did to cheat these emission scan, uh, schemes is they said that their car produced this amount of carbon dioxide, but they found that the car's computer had two settings depending on if the door was open. If the door was open, it ran clean. Whereas if the door was closed, it ran dirty. And um, that was because they couldn't get the efficiency they wanted. And the reason for that is that typically efficient, um, emissions testing is done with the door open. And so when they were discovered for this, they got fined. But like many many t things, the fine they got was like only a fraction of the money they made and you know probably didn't really discourage that behavior. So anyway, uh, okay. Um, as we're starting to finish up, so okay, the internal combustion engine. So we're, we're going to learn about this system. So inherently, what it does is it takes a non-renewable resource, which is octane. Uh, so octane is made from, we talked about, I can't pronounce it very well, but the Carboniferous era. Let's see if that finds it. There we go. The Paleozoic era, the Carboniferous era. Um, I was hoping that would give me a pronunciation. But anyway, during this time, uh, trees didn't decompose. And because trees didn't decompose, they just built up in this, these layers on the earth. And that when they got crushed by the pressure of subsequent layers of earth on top, they formed into fossil fuels, into oil, gas, and coal. Um, there's a finite amount of that. When we run out, there's no more. Um, and we take some of this octane, which is a carbon compound. It's got eight carbons and some hydrogens attached to it. And it burns good. When you, uh, when you provide enough energy to get it started, it starts splitting up into carbon dioxide, releasing energy in the process. That release of energy, that release of ke um, ke chemical energy, we can use to power ke uh, kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy can drive our engine. Now, not only is this a finite resource, so, okay, so the alternative is we can use ethanol. Ethanol is also a carbon-based organic compound. Uh, the difference is that it's rather than waiting for millions of years of pressure to turn trees into octane, instead we can use a smaller and more readily available uh, common compound. The problem with this, and I mean, this is the question, is, you know, is everything a problem then, is that yes it's more environmentally sound it's not as fuel efficient so if you're interested in money you probably still don't want to get uh, the e10 um, you're probably getting worse value for money if you get e10 then there's also the element of once e10 started to become a widely used thing that the food for the world's poorest people the cost of food for the world's poorest people just doubled because this ethanol is usually made from things that would have otherwise been food so now you could argue that the food could be made from food that was going to be thrown out, so like waste food. But typically, the people who make E10, they're just they're taking food that uh, crops that could have been used as food and turning it into to, yeah, a lot of the time corn. Um, corn is a huge aspect of um, American agriculture. Um, it's what grows well. Anyway, so that's the first problem. The second problem is that it produces carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. That means it traps heat on the in the Earth's atmosphere. The increased heat in the Earth's atmosphere leads to what we call climate change. The Im biggest impacts of climate change is that we have an increase in natural disasters, things like fires and floods, 
and um, tornadoes, I guess. Uh, basically, it, it leads to things like droughts. Um, the, the increased temperature increases drought and the risk of fire. But in the case of things like flood, um, the melting of glacial ice uh, above the earth, uh, the uh, above the ocean level, that then increases the water levels. Also, the fact that increased heat means that the ocean can hold more water in the air, which means you're more likely to get um, powerful storms. Um, all of those things are problems, and it's something we're trying to avoid. So we're trying to limit the amount of carbon dioxide released into the air, or at least. In theory, that's what we're trying to do. So, okay, that's the, the problem with internal combustion engines. The big alternative to this is using electrical engines. Now, the thing is that it's important to say that electrical engines still often run off coal-based electricity. So in Australia, we get all of our electricity from coal, some, to, some from natural gas, but mostly from coal. Um, and that, uh, that said, we can generate electricity cleanly from wind and solar. And even if we did use it from coal, we'd rather get our electricity from coal, which can be supplied through very, very efficient uh, electrical networks than from fossil fuels, because fossil fuels have to be carried. They have to be carried in containers from the Middle East or wherever they're being collected. And then they, they're carried in very, very polluting containers as they're carried in these boats. And then from boats, they're sent on, uh, on trucks as they go from the docks to each service station. And then in your car, instead of having a big factory that um, can process that, that petrochemical, instead you have a little engine. And it's way, it's way easier to get efficiency in something the size of 10 schools than it is to get efficiency out of something the size of a lunchbox. Well, I mean, the average engine isn't the size of a lunchbox. The size of, I don't know, the size of an engine. Um, it is bigger than a bread box. Okay, so, um, what I'm going to finish on today is I'm just going to finish on the four-stroke process because I think we're running out of time. So the four-stroke engine process is this. We talked a little bit about this before. Generally, people remember SSBB. So if you think about like a boat being the SSBB, that might help you. You can There's a wine that's called SSB, and then if you have a bottle of that, you'd have an SSBB. I don't know. Whatever helps you to remember it, that's the order, right? SSBB. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Right, so the suck is the intake. When we squeeze it, it's compression. So once we have that compressed air, the spark plug fires and it explodes the compressed. Pe uh, so, okay, I'll go through the, the, the suck a little bit better. So, what happens first is that we suck in air and we add in a fuel mixture. Right, so we need oxygen to burn. So you can't have combustion with, without oxygen. The octane can't turn into carbon dioxide and water without oxygen in the process. So it needs to take in air and then we add in, we spray fuel into the mixture. Then we compress that oxygen fuel mixture. We then explode the oxygen fuel mixture, which creates the downward force. And this downward force is what gives us, we actually have two rotations of this piston for every explosion. So we go down here and we go down here. There's no force that's causing that to go there. The only reason this goes down is because of the momentum of the, the power stroke. So the power stroke is what sets this whole thing off. Okay, so suck, squeeze, bang, blow. The power stroke is what um, keeps the, the thing going. Once we've um, had the power, we then have to blow out the carbon dioxide, the spent fuel, so that we can then take in new fuel. So um, in terms of suck, squeeze, bang, blow, I'm sure you could come up with a narrative that involved those four verbs. But um, for you guys, like it, it is worth knowing. I used to put this in tests, but then it was pointed out to me it's not really explicitly stated in the syllabus. So it's something I'm not likely to test you on. But it's something you should read, and I'm going to make you do it for homework. Okay, the difference is with a diesel. I'm going to get you to read the diesel stuff for homework, but the difference for diesels is that they don't have a spark plug. They have a heat lamp, and the, 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 just the heat is enough that um, diesel will self-ignite at a lower temperature and a lower pressure. Okay, they don't talk about the two-stroke engine in this, but I will also ask you to compare. So that's going to be your homework, is I'm going to ask you to compare a four-stroke petrol engine to a four-stroke diesel engine and a two-stroke petrol engine. Okay, so that will be it for today. That's We're now on to mechanics and hydraulics. I'm not necessarily going to have a talk-through lesson tomorrow. I might just have a time for you guys to write homework. So um, that's the plan. 
Um, I hope that was worthwhile and I'm now going to stop my recording. See, see you guys next time.